Hello everyone, welcome to theCUBE's live coverage here in San Francisco, California for VMware Explore, not VMworld. It's VMware Explore. I'm John Furrier, your host of theCUBE with Dave Vellante. We're here with two sets. 12th year, Dave, covering VMworld now, VMware Explore. What a journey. I had a little reminiscing from Paul Moritz in 2010 who predicted the future, but the timing was off. Ragu predicting the future, but is his timing right with multi-cloud or super cloud? We're going to get into it. We got three days of wall-to-wall -wall cube coverage, two sets, all the top execs from VMware coming on, including the CEO Ragu himself, Vittorio, Kit Colbert, the whole kit and caboodle of the executive group to talk about the future of VMware, where it's going, and of course, the appearance of Hawk Tan here from Broadcom. Dave made an appearance. Michael Dell was also in presence. I get the vibe that there's something going on with Broadcom and VMware uh, beyond just the acquisition. So a lot of people are curious. This event, again, is notable and historic from the sense of it's VMworld, VMware Explorer, not VMworld, so they changed the name, and Broadcom's intent, and they're going to be buying VMworld. Dave, the keynote was anticipated by all how it was going to go down, what was going to be said. Ragu set the table. I got a ton of notes. I know you do. What's your take? Well, you have to start with, with the Broadcom acquisition. You're right, Hawk Tam was in the audience, he stood up, he got a little clap. Golf he, clap. He's, he's paying <laughs> $60 billion for VMware, he better be able to be recognized. And he was here yesterday with Michael Dell at the executive sessions, and, and their purpose, I'm sure, I mean, they didn't let us in, but I'm, per, the, I'm sure the purpose was to make sure that customers were calm, they were comfortable with the direction, of course, the narrative coming out of VMware is you know, that, hey, they, 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 they're investigating, they're going deep into our portfolio, and they like what they see, it's going to be all good, it's not going to be like the CA uh, uh, acquisition and delevering and all that stuff. I mean, I still stand by what I wrote in my breaking analysis back in May. The fact is, Broadcom has promised $8.5 billion in EBITDA within three years. That's the only way they get there is to, to cut. So that's going to happen. But, but, but the interesting dynamic in the market, I don't know if you've noticed this, Bro, uh, VMware stock is trading at a 20% discount to what Broadcom is paying for it. Okay, so there's a big amount of fluff if you want to you know, you know, do, do some arbitration. Uh, but, but, and I think it's due to the fact that it's a, it's a, it's a, a stock and a cash deal you know, it's a combination deal, and it's not going to close for a year. So there's maybe some skepticism around that, but that was an interesting dynamic. The keynote, we'll get into it, but it's all around multi-cloud and what we call super cloud. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I have my conspiracy theories on Broadcom, obviously they make chips. You're looking at all the waves right now in the technology industry, silicon is hot. Anyone who's doing custom silicon and putting software on the chip, making purpose-built you know, vertical applications, has seen performance gains you know, in cloud and in these applications. So one, I'm really excited by the, the dots connecting with there. But also the VMware uh, story, Dave, is pretty interesting in the sense that timing's everything, the Broadcom acquisition, EBITDA focus might drive behavior, but Notable for VMware is Ragu has been on this vision for years. I remember in 2016 when I interviewed him with Andy Jassy, who was then the CEO of AWS, they had moved everything to Amazon Web Services and that was the beginning of the vision of multi-cloud and cloud native. VMware invested a ton and so we're seeing some fruit come off the tree, if you will, bearing some fruit from that VMware investment in cloud native across the board, which was their bet prior to Broadcom buying them out. So the question is, does Broadcom harvest that, continue that nurturing of that, quote, plantation of goodness that could come out of that VMware? And again, it's probability, it's not guaranteed. Commentary on Twitter is pretty heavy on, can they win the devs, can ops, the new ops, bring it around the front. So VMware's in a, and Broadcom's in a tough position. They bought more than they thought, in my opinion. And I think a lot of people are saying, does Broadcom recognize the strategic value of what's coming out of the oven, so to speak, or what's blooming off the tree from VMware, and is it real? That is the number one question I talk to people in the hallway. That's what they're saying. They want to know what's going to happen with what's around the corner. That's on top of mind and of everybody. It's a, it's a really important question because VMware's future is multi-cloud management, what we call super cloud. And without Tanzu, and I speculated that, that Tanzu was probably going to be you know, under the microscope and potentially on the chopping block because it's, it, they're spending a lot of money marketing it, but they're probably not today getting a lot of returns. But without Tanzu, without a cross-cloud PaaS, what we sometimes call a super PaaS, the, the, the strategy doesn't work. It, it basically fails. And I think what a lot of people are missing, and I've, I saw you chime in on Twitter, is 
you know, can they win the devs, can they win the devs? This is table stakes. If you don't have a cross-cloud pass, and it's really about not necessarily just the devs, it's about the ops, right? Because now it's about security. Yes, shift left, but shield right. But the, the DevOps team, the ops team needs consistency. Yeah. You know, it's like Adrian Cockroft says, the, the devs, uh, they love to get married. The yeah. ops, they got to clean up after the divorce. And yeah. so they need standards. Implying they that need they can, they'll use any tool for the job and not really worry about lock-in. And I think you know, today on the keynote, one of the, uh, Deshaun was up there, who, was, who made a comment, you kids have it easy these days, implying you know, us old guys when we coded, you had to do everything yourself. And Kelsey Hightower mentioned you know, support yeah, back, story. desktop edition. Yeah. You know, the old days when you know, had to build everything by hand, now it's all automated, all goodness. But in all seriousness, the, the focus there was DevOps has won. DevOps is what the developers are doing. The developers are in the clear right now as far as I'm concerned. They have, they're sitting on the beach right now, sunglasses on, sun shining, everything's shift left, CI CD pipeline, cloud native goodness. If you're a dev, things are much rosier than an ops person. So DevOps is developer. Security and data ops is where the action is. So it's not so much IT operations, as it is security and data leveling up to the velocity demand of, of developers and also ease of use. So self-service in the, in, in the motion of coding, in the pipelining, that's what the developers have to have. And if people don't build that experience from the ops side, the new ops, it's not going to enable the developers. It won't be adopted, in my opinion. You know, you mentioned uh, Paul Moritz before, his whole thing was any workload, any cloud, the software mainframe. They're talking about any Kubernetes, any cloud. And, and it's, we got to go through some of the announcements real quick here. VMware Aria is the, the new multi-cloud management platform. That is the fundamental strategy for going cross-cloud, or what we call super cloud. The v, vSphere and vSAN 8 are big deals. And as it relates to compute with vSphere, they're really pushing that whole DPU. You might remember Project Monterey. Yeah. Well, Project Monterey is essentially like AWS Nitro. It's the future of computing architecture, you know, seven years after AWS mm -hmm. introduced it. So AWS is a huge yeah. lead here, but it's, it's critical that a company like VMware is able to offer that capability with, 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 with XPU optionality, GPU, CPU, ARM-based, you know, Pensando, capabilities, eventually NPUs, other capabilities to bring in and support new workloads, new data-driven workloads. So a lot of talk about the whole DPU thing. Uh, you know, uh, as I mentioned, Tanzu, new version of Tanzu, they talked about edge. You know, they're, they're basically bringing VMware to the edge with an eventual consistency model hold and on, a horizon hold on. On, the, on, the v, on the vSphere thing, just to jump in there real quick. I was thought that that'd be higher up in the keynote. Clearly in the keynote, they flexed their cloud native positioning. They had to address the Broadcom thing, talk about modern applications. So it felt like they were selling the dream on the front end. And they kind of buried the lead, in my opinion, which is vSphere 8. They don't do a lot of vSphere 8 announcements. If you look at the history of VMworld, it's very, every few years they got a new release. This was packed with a lot of goodness, and I thought they buried that in the keynote. I don't know, I mean, I mean you know, Raghu mentioned it, and, and yeah. yeah, I mean, they had a lot to cover. Uh, but, but, and then the other thing was they announced uh, support for Red Hat OpenShift. So everybody's like, ooh, wow. And then, you know, Tanzu for you know, any, all the Kubernetes versions from, from the, the cloud guys. So, you know, a, a lot of announcements, you got to always give VMware props. It's not like they stopped you know, engineering. They have a great <laughs> engineering culture. And so it's nice to see Project Monterey in particular go from R&D to actual product. And so, you know, we like to see yeah, that. Even, even, even towards the end, now that we're doing a keynote review, he's, Ragu said, as proud as we are, kind of, this is when they start talking about the sustainability, you know, implying they're real proud engineering. I and mean, that's a good, good call out there. And I think that's what they're trying to get across to Hawk 10 who's sitting in the front rows. But, you know, Dave, I mean, in terms of keynote, my analysis is clear. Ragu was nervous, you can tell, but he's not, he's a product guy. He even said that on stage. Um, he set the table at the beginning, I thought, really well with modern applications. He had to address the name change. I thought that was interesting. He actually said, we built a community with VMworld, but now with multi-cloud, we're going to recall it Explore. Not sure I agree with that. I mean, I think VMworld community is still vibrant, and that's why they're here. So I thought that was kind of a nice, ready balance that out. The messaging is good, the graphics and the branding of Explore is uh, world class. I think it's phenomenal. 
you know, I'm not a big fan of the name change, but I never, I'll never go well with change there. Um, Hock Tan didn't speak, he did stand up and wave. Yeah, but he no way he's going to get up he, and speak. He didn't anyway. speak. So I thought that was an interesting front end, so they got that right out of the way, and, you, and you, that's what you were saying last night. And then they got into this digitally smart concept, which I thought was kind of on point. Did not like the great replatforming message. I didn't, not a big fan of that because it reminded me of the great resignation. I think there's going to be a lot of memes on that, so not a big fan of the great replatforming. Um, I did like the um, uni cloud universal pitch, but this whole multi-cloud pitch seems to me, and I want to get your thoughts on this, is that that's what it reminded me of Paul Moritz. So when Ragu, it's clearly he's betting the ranch on multi-cloud. Okay, well, the question is timing. Paul Moritz in 2010 here at VMware, VMworld Moscone, he laid out the vision. He was right, but timing was off, the top of the stack didn't materialize. But at the end of the day, it ended up being the right architecture. Is VMware too early with multi-cloud, Dave? And that's the question. That's the question on the table. Well, uh, so a couple things. For Moritz, the mistake, the one mistake Moritz made was he really tried to go into apps, remember? Okay, so now at least, I think, you know, Raghu, the current VMware thinking is, we're going to enable apps to be developed, and that is the right thinking. Are they too early or too late with multi-cloud? I think, you know, technically it just wasn't feasible. The, 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 the customers weren't ready for it. You know, VMware moves at the speed of the CIO, we like to say. So I think the timing is actually really good because the technical capabilities are now there. You've got to have a cross-cloud you know, paths, which Tanzu is about. And I think Tanzu was too immature before. They've got the pieces on the DPU side. And the other thing about the timing is now with Broadcom acquiring VMware, the whole non-Dell ecosystem has got to be a lot happier. Right, you know, uh, NetApp, you know, guys Why like that. Why is that? Cisco, because, because Dell had the, they had their thumb on the scale. They had the thing rigged. I mean, <laughs> Dell, Dell was sort of first in line for everything. You know, when, when EMC owned VMware, that was the case, but they were quiet about it. But Dell made no concessions. They just came out and said, we are going to be VMware first. We are the preferred partner. We do more business with anybody. They really drove a truck through that. And I think it caused a lot of the ecosystem to pull back, like HPE and others, to say, okay, we're going to find some alternatives here. Yeah. Now they can really lean in. It's like when HP broke in two. That really changed the ecosystem posture with HPE, Th that, this is like that, but times 10. What did you think about the ecosystem floor last night? We went, did a walk on the floor. I thought it was very vibrant. It was not a ghost town at all. No, not at all. We saw Alibaba Cloud was there. We saw a lot of AWS, smaller companies. AWS, Microsoft. Yeah, right, and so I thought it was better than I thought it would be. You know, there's probably what, 7,000 people here, I would say. Mm -hmm. You know, so well off from the 15,000, you know, pre-COVID highs, but still very robust. It's, you know, it's a good crowd. People are excited to be you know, back in person, obviously. Um, and you know, I think the messaging was right, John. I think cross-cloud, multi-cloud, super-cloud, that is the future where David Floyer took a stab at it. I think it's going to be a $100 billion market by yeah. the end of the decade. Super-cloud's super a thing for sure, and I think that came out in the uh, ARIA announcement, which is basically a rebranding. It it's not a new product, essentially it's a cobbled together management platform. I thought the cloud universal notes here were interesting. The cloud universal is the commercial cloud smart component, meaning they're trying to make that the frame, Dave, for the hyperscalers to kind of come in to a um, de facto consortium movement. I feel like that's next here. If this cloud universal could become the super cloud consortium, that might give them a better shot. The ecosystem is buzzing. Uh, attendance is strong. It's interesting, you know, you know, a lot of people are speculating, will this be um, an event? I thought they did a great job, and I thought they came through well with this. This is what you're saying about a consortium, because you, know, you, you have to have the cloud guys in any consortium, but are, is any one cloud going to drive it? VMware could, AWS. Be, could be the driver. You think I mean, I, I'm driver? thinking if I, if I had to make a prediction, looking at what I just saw in the keynote, we'll see what the VMware execs say. If I had to make a guess, I think you're going to have customers Let's still double down on VMware stuff. They're going to settle into vSphere and uh, networking, uh, compute and storage, the normal stuff that they got, the software-defined data center core as a cloud operational platform. And then you're going to see a lot more AWS migration. You might see that if Broadcom doesn't if Broadcom doesn't nurture the, 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 the fruit coming off the tree, as we mentioned earlier, I think you might see people go more cloud native, but I think VMware's prepared for that with the hybrid. So it's going to be very interesting to see. I think the winners coming out of this will be AWS, maybe a little bit of trickle into Azure. Um, not, I'll 
Bob, but mostly for the European, I mean the China side, but I, I see, don't see them playing. Google is a wild card, we'll see it from them. I think the other big thing about the timing, to your earlier point, is you know, VMware used to go to market with very bespoke, okay, we got vSAN, we got NSX, we got vSphere, and now they're trying to bring that together. And, and, and essentially, remember, they used to go to market and say, okay, hey, your ELA is up. Time to renew, like, and they're talking to the wrong people, and so now they're really, they're going forth with an as a service model, they're going to move to a subscription model, and I think the timing is right for that. Uh, I, I would have liked to seen it a little bit beforehand, maybe pre-COVID yeah. pre would have been better timing, but I think technically the time is right now for yeah. that. And I think looking at the acquisition, kind of speculating on that, I mean, think, let's discuss kind of how we see things, how they might move forward, again, we'll ask, the guess as much as best we can and the best they could answer, but let's think, let's take this forward, okay? Based upon what I'm seeing here, if I'm Hawk Tan in the audience, I'm saying to myself, okay, I got more here than I thought I was buying. Maybe I thought I was getting some great EBITDA. I wonder if his outlook changes on how he goes to market with the new VMware post acquisition. So that means in around February timeframe, I would probably, if I was advising him to say, okay, let's keep it as is, let's not do the, cut, 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 maybe trim a little bit here and there, but for the most part, he's got the solid base, customer base, and he's going to have to keep the event. It, here's the problem with that. You know, they have a very high do-say ratio. They do what they say they're going to do, and as a result, they've promised 8.5 billion in EBITDA by, within three years out of uh, VMware, and they return 50% of their free cash flow to investors. If they break that promise, their stock will get crushed. So I don't think they're going to break that promise. So I think they're going to run. That's, that's something I believe in their playbook yeah. that they're not going to change. Now, could they get there without massive cuts? I think it's going to be hard. Can they get there with price increases? Yes, and better efficiency? Yes. Uh, but they don't have a lot of go-to-market synergies, John. Yeah. Broadcom doesn't have a big sales force that they can say, okay, we're going to fire all the VMware sales force and, and, and you're going to go to market through our channel like Oracle would do with their big sales force or like a Dell would do with yeah. an acquisition. They can't. Uh, and so I just don't see how they're going to round it. Round it. The only, other thing I would say is, to me, I, I thought the application development piece, the Tanzu piece was very appropriate. Uh, and I think they got it. Whether or not they're going to succeed there, we can debate that. But I thought what was missing was, was there wasn't enough, in my opinion, on their security posture, their security strategy. Yeah. I thought they gave it lip service with, oh yeah, we're going to shift left and you know, dev security, et cetera. They did not go in depth. I think, I think you know, when you talk to someone like Tom Gillis, who really can go deep, yeah. I think they, talk about burying the lead. That was not, security is the number one issue on data CIOs, is, data CISOs, and CSOs, yeah. it boards, it's number one. And data is the second thing. And, and, yeah. and, and those two stories in the yeah. keynote yeah. were you know, quasi non-existent or, and or weak. Okay. Again, and the reason why I, I believe, and you're discussing it publicly at a high level, is super cloud is real because it's not just SaaS on cloud, it's hybrid, it's DevOps, as developer. And security and data operations are just, absolutely now leveling up, and the Edge is a complete wild card. We met a, a company last night, they're doing the, uh, the Edge Cloud. The Edge is going to open up all kinds of new use cases and challenges, so I think, you know, and that's on the data, ops, data security side. DevOps, IT operations is already in the dev cycle. If companies aren't doing that, in my opinion, they're not really doing it right, so I think the sh it'll shift to security and ops and, and data ops, that's going to be the action. In the cloud operational framework, that's super cloud. To me, if I'm Hawk Tan, I'm saying VMworld, VMware Explore, VMware has to be a core component of super cloud of the future. Not multi-cloud, that's just a kind of a state. I think multi-cloud is just an, uh, will be a, a description of, of a state of, of an architecture and an outcome, but that's not super cloud. That's not a functioning operating system. That's not a functioning business driver. Uh, uh, driven technology. So I think VMware is opportunity. So I, I look at that and say, I got chip options all the way up to the top of the stack and super cloud pass layer, as you described it, I think is the way to go. And you think about how VMware got here. VMware is a $13 billion trailing 12 month revenue company. There aren't a lot of $13 billion software companies. And the way VMware got here is through great software engineering. Okay, they, they identify problems that the customers had and they went and solved them. They did it with virtualization, they did it with private cloud. You know, they're doing it with, 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 they figured out their public cloud strategy. So I think the question for Broadcom is going to be, okay, how fast can we monetize that engineering? Can we turn that engineering R&D into dollars and how fast can we do that? You know, they have two choices in my opinion. Keep innovating, which of course we hope that's the case, or 
you know, act like a private equity firm and just squeeze as much cash out of, out of, of, of VMware as possible, uh, which I don't think would be the right strategy because eventually that, that says, okay, what's going to happen to Broadcom? How are they going to you know, continue to grow? They're going to have to just keep growing through acquisitions. So I think R&D is a really good spend when it's VMware. And I think as we wrap up our keynote analysis, one of the things that's going to come out of this is the conversation, no doubt in my mind, will be VMware isn't CA. And the question is, does Broadcom go off their playbook with VMware because of the fact that you look at the sponsorships for the show, we got a robust set of sponsorships for theCUBE with two sets, we're booked, fully loaded, um, conversations high, the floor is all about next level cloud operations. This is not a dying market. I mean, this is like a growth wave coming. So the question, as super cloud becomes that growth, and everyone's talking about super cloud, there, you know, some people don't like the name, which is good, keep crazy debate, but there's no doubt that that next wave is the super cloud philosophy, the super cloud mindset and architecture and development environment, and we've documented that on supercloud.world if anyone's interested, but that wave is coming, and you can see it on the floor, look at the sponsors, look at what people are talking about, Dave. This is not like we're, we're buying VMware, Broadcom buying VMware and tucking it under and saying, okay, I hope we can service the customer. There's a real market growth here story, so the question yeah. is, what do you do with that? Well, so the, the, you start with the base. VMware is a very good platform. I mean, it, the, the reason why they don't have a ton of competition and the reason why, you know, okay, Nutanix can maybe trickle some away, but VMware is, is really good. It works, it's, it's stable, it recovers from, from, from failures, it's got a super strong ecosystem. So you start by building there and then you identify the places where you can, you know, spend a dollar and make it, make it 10. Well, I was very excited that when we had our SuperCloud event, which was kind of a uh, virtual event as a test, we had great VMware support, and a lot of the catalog sessions up here on Moscone West, where we're sitting upstairs, is all the sessions. They're crowded, and they overlay day with our narrative and the industry narrative on the influencer side. You're starting to see the influencers meeting our editorial and pushing with SuperCloud with VMware and their ecosystem, kind of agreeing SuperCloud is real. And I think that is an important uh, note because just last December when we coined the term at reInvent, AWS reInvent, look what's happened. And I want to get your thoughts and reaction to why SuperCloud has got so much traction. I mean, it's a great buzz with the name, but why is it that our SuperCloud, the VMware, and the ecosystem are all aligning with this? Why do you think that's happening? Why do you think that the momentum is accelerating? The reason is that, as everybody knows, the organizations have multiple clouds. It's a function of, of shadow, uh, devs, uh, M&A, and so they end up with all these different clouds, all these different, di different projects, different primitives, different APIs, different tool sets, okay, and it's, they called it cloud chaos today, it's accurate, it is cloud chaos. Okay, so what's, I mean, what, so what's the problem with that? Well, that makes it harder to secure, it makes it harder to govern, it makes it harder to share data, it creates data silos. What's the answer? Well, if you can create a layer that's an abstraction layer that simplifies all that cr cross-cloud data sharing, and development and have a consistent set of APIs through a PaaS layer, we call it super PaaS, and you're going to have a metadata <laughs> intelligence that says, okay, I'm going, to, I'm going to put this here, I'll put that there, and I'm going to deal with latency, I'm going to optimize for whatever purpose, data sharing or performance or whatever it is, you're going to solve a lot of problems and you're going to make the CIO's life easier so that they can invest in their own business and their digital, digital uh, transformation and their digital strategy. So that's why people agree. Yeah. They might not agree with the name, but they certainly agree with the concept yeah, well, the that that abstraction layer the, the is... The name is certainly a better name than multi-cloud. Multi-cloud sounds broken, but I think CIOs and CXOs, CISOs, CSOs have to get buy-in from their teams. The organic dev relationship with ops and SecOps and data ops has to be symbiotic, not conflicting. And I love the chaos story because as Andy Grove, the legend at Intel, um, as once said, let chaos reign and then reign in the chaos. And chaos is cash. And so, <laughs> so in any innovation uh, inflection point, chaos becomes the complexity abstraction layers and or innovation takes that complexity away. This is the formula for success and I think VMware's right in the middle of it and I think if I'm looking at VMware right now, I'm saying, you know, hey, reign in that chaos right now and you win, right? So chaos is not a bad thing if you can rein it in, Dave, right? And that's <laughs> what they've done. You think about what they did, did with virtualization. It was chaotic, it was wasteful. I think what they did with private cloud. They said, hey, IT guys, we're going to help you not get cloudified. We're going to cloudify your, your presence on-prem and not just have throw everything into the cloud. They did a great job there, and now it's all about multi-cloud. Well, we're going to rein in the chaos, extract the signal from the noise. Supercube here at SuperCloud event 
VMware Explorer, Dave, great to kick it off again. Again, 12th year of CUBE coverage. It seems like a lifetime, Dave, just yesterday. We were Amazing, in right? We've now. been in Moscone South. We've been, we've been, <laughs> we've been in North. We've been in Las Vegas. It's uh, now we're here. Some of these in West. First time in West. Some of these developers were in elementary school when uh, when we started the Cube here. <laughs> it just feel like old relics. Anyway, we're going to bring more action. Three days of coverage. TheCube.net. Check it out. Join our community. Join the conversation as the influencers are coming more onto the market. You're seeing a lot more conversations on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on the internet. Check it out. Join join the conversation. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. We'll be back with more coverage here in San Francisco after this break. <laughs>